Um, back to this. So this section is talking about the different ways that you might uh, attach or hold in place different pieces of a, uh, like a pulley. I've got a pulley here. Uh, I took this off of a drill press that I have in my shop. Uh, and so it's a stepped pulley. It's got different, uh, uh, a little belt that would go around it and attach to another pulley and you can change the drive ratio of the drill press, how fast it's spinning. Um, but what it has on it is it has a couple of things. It has a little groove here. Let's see if I can find something smaller. It has a little groove right down in there. Uh, it's kind of hard to see because it's dark. You can, yeah, you can see it there. Um, so that one, it's kind of worn out, but uh, that would be where a key goes. Here's the little key that came out of it. Um, this one's a little bit of a s tapered key. Um, but this little key would fit into this groove and there's a matching groove on the shaft that's still on the drill press. I can't really get that off. Um, not easily anyway. Uh, so we've got, uh, that's one way. And, uh, so this little guy would keep the, uh, if the shaft, you know, if the pulley was on the shaft, it would keep the, uh, pulley and the shaft spinning at the same rate. They would both spin together. Um, if something bound up though, um, the little key, sometimes these are called uh, shear keys or uh, the point of them is also not just to keep the torque transfer between the shaft and the pulley, but also in case something does bind up, they are a part that are, can fail, they can shear um, in right on that surface. And uh, this little key is pretty easy to replace or cheap to replace rather. Uh, versus something that might be a little more expensive or time-consuming to replace. This pulley also has um, a set screw on it, which, let's see if we can go ahead and take the guy out of there. Uh, let's see, is this, nope, wrong size. There it goes. So this guy is also in here. So actually, this is one, I hadn't taken it out yet, I just now took it out. Um, if we look over here, here are different uh, types of set screws. Sometimes you call them grub screws. Looks like this one most cl closely matches uh, the half dog point. So it ha has a little point on the end of it. But they uh, have different points on the ends. So, lost my pointer. Anyway, they have different points on the end over here to make contact with the shaft. So these guys will sometimes be used in conjunction with pins, uh, well, keys. Probably wouldn't be used in conjunction with a pin. That's a different thing. This shaft does not have a pin on it. Um, and this pulley doesn't. Uh, but the uh, point of them is that this surface will push against the shaft and create a, enough uh, friction to hold the pulley in place. Um, a lot of times you'll see two of these. Like this one only has one because it has a keyway and a uh, a set screw but a lot of times you'll see a set screw maybe here and another set screw 90 degrees or 120 degrees from that first one um, to help constrain the uh, pulley on the shaft that it's attached to um, so what I thought I'd do is go through a couple of examples of how we don't have a chart for this little guy um, in your book you only have the set screws you only have a uh, chart that shows socket set screws um, now none of these are named socket set screws but it's uh, the uh, cup point so instead of having this protruding in they actually have a little indention here you can kind of see it in that picture um, where it's cupped inward there um, and so we have that one we don't really have this one would actually probably provide a little bit more holding power but um, the only chart we have is for uh, the socket or the cup style. So we'll use that uh, as an example. So how we would do that. Let's get these, get my book all dirty. Let's get these out of the way. Come over here. Um, we'll have to come back to the book. But let's put it out of the way. <coughs> all right. Um, so let's, let's just take something like what we had here with just the one. Like I said, a lot of times you'll have two um, because uh, if you just have one, uh, it will, let's, let's, 
draw what might happen here. Let me see. Don't know where I put my... Here we go. All right, let's get this guy. So here, I'm just not use that big. Let's say that this is the pulley, and then like maybe the outer part of the pulley, and it's got an inner part. Let's make it this size, something like this. All right, and so those should be concentric. We didn't draw them quite concentric, that's okay. Um, what we'll do now is let's draw something that represents the shaft. So this is the pulley. Uh, maybe we've got our set screw. You know, it's coming in right here. And this little guy would sit in here. Oh, right, right in there. Right. And so normally there's some difference in the shaft that goes in the pulley and the hole in the pulley itself so that there's a easy to slide on fit um, something we'll talk about later i don't know if it'll be in this one or not but later on we'll talk about interference fits where the hole in the pulley is actually smaller than the shaft um, and you have to press them together um, we'll i don't think we'll do that today though but i'm going to exaggerate the difference here. Let's put a much smaller. So here, this is going to be the shaft. So it's way smaller. Uh, obviously, they're not that much smaller, but they are some smaller. Uh, so let's. All right. So one reason you might put a uh, set screw in here, you know, it's going to screw down and press against the shaft right there. And just using one of them um, is somewhat common, but a lot of times you'll, you will see them in pairs, so there'd be another one over here. A lot of times they're just at 90 degrees to one another um, to keep the, uh, the pulley um, not only constrained on the shaft from moving this way and this way, but you might add another one to keep it from doing like this. Obviously this is a very exaggerated example, but um, a second one would keep this kind of motion from happening a little bit. Um, we're just going to do the one. So let's, let's, uh, let's say that this is our, so you can see it, this is our little set screw in here. So we're trying to transfer torque, right? So uh, let's say that we have, this is the torque we're trying to transfer. We need some dimensions um, and they don't have to be super accurate but uh, let's just say that this guy has a radius equal to uh, let's make it a quarter inch so it's a half inch diameter shaft the actual one is probably more like three quarters if I'm gonna look at um, but it doesn't matter we're just making making up numbers <coughs> So this is our shaft, the orange parts of the shaft, has a radius of a quarter inch. Actually, what are our units? We have units in our book. Uh, now, your book uses the word over here. When I'm looking at the chart, um, it does have this thing called holding power, but then it has units of pound force. So power is not the most correct term they could have used here, but maybe that's a standard thing. This would be something like you would look up in a chart somewhere that uh, would give you data on the set screws that you're using maybe holding power is what they kind of term that normally um, so anyway um, these obviously again are for the socket screws and they have a size over here uh, some of them are uh, index size and some of them are fractional size um, our little guy I don't know let's say that he's a uh, well hold on looks like He's going to be one, two, eh, maybe, maybe three sixteenths. Do we have a three sixteenths in here? We have a five sixteenths. We have a quarter. Let's just call him a, well, he's not a quarter though. Um, let's just call him a number 10. We'll call him a number 10. 
And it, again, this is for the cup anyway, so not the uh, half dog point. Um, this seating torque in the middle, that's basically when you install this thing. So when you're over here and you're installing it, oops, other way. Uh, it's how much torque do you twist with to actually make sure it's seated on the shaft correctly. So that's more of a spec when you're installing the uh, set screw to begin with. Um, so we don't need that number um, other than if you were designing this thing, you would have a call out that says what seating torque you needed to use to make sure that you actually actually engage the set screw the right amount. Um, okay. Um, so if we call him a number 10, then he has 540 pounds holding power, pound force. So 540 is what we're looking at. So that's for if he's a number 10 cup, um, what's the full name? Cup point. And again, holding power, not quite the right word, but that's what we got. 540 pound force. So what this 540 pounds is, is it's talking about the uh, tangential force between our set screw and the shaft. So let's let's take and draw just the uh, shaft over here. Let's put him, you can see over there. Let's take our shaft over here. There's the shaft. And then the um, torque or holding power that they're talking about would be uh, right here. So something like that. Um, or I guess you could just to have all the free body. And so that would... Uh, have a, a torque that would be able to create a torque in the shaft that the shaft either the shaft is turning the pulley or the pulley is turning the shaft I don't know um, oh wait that didn't show up let's make it a little bigger there we go maybe that's easier to see all right so 540 pounds there would be a opposing torque that we're trying to figure out how much we could carry um, and we still have our radius of a quarter inch. And then it's just a matter of torque equals force times radius. So we're able to apply 540 pounds of tangential force at a radius of a quarter inch. And we'll end up with how many inch pounds? Let's see, 540 times 0 0.25, 135 inch pounds. Now you'll notice, or maybe you've asked uh, in your mind, uh, what about, there's probably some torque or friction over here. And that's true, there probably is. You're pushing this uh, shaft into the hole. You know, you're pushing it into the hole uh, that's on the pulley or whatever element it could be a gear or whatever. Um, so there probably is some frictional force between the shaft and this side, wherever you shoved it into the other side of the hole. Um, normally you ignore that because it's, uh, you don't really know how to calculate it. And, uh, so what we did here by ignoring that is that, well, we basically are, having a more conservative approach to um, uh, estimating our holding torque that we're able to deal with. So if this was a number 10 uh, cut point and that diameter is a in half inch, uh, we had a radius of 0.25, then we should be able to transmit 135 inch pounds of torque uh, from this pulley to that shaft or vice versa from that shaft to the pulley. Um, whichever way it's going. Uh, in this case, uh, the pulley on the drill press is actually transmitting the torque into the shaft. This is the shaft that would actually be turning the spindle uh, of your drill press. And next to it, actually over here, there's another pulley. This is the driving pulley. Um, 
lost the belt for them. I don't know where it went. Oh, well. There's a belt that goes between them uh, that lets you uh, drive this pulley. This pulley drives the shaft of the spindle of the drill press, and then you can drill holes and stuff. Um, this one also, it probably has, let's see, it's kind of dirty. Oh, yeah, right down in there. Uh, I don't know if you can see it or not, but down in there, it has just a set screw. It does not have, well, it does have a different feature. Um, so this one, it's harder to see because it's way down in there. But I don't know if you can see it or not. But inside this one, I don't think you're going to be able to pick it up. There is a flat spot down inside here. Like this hole looks around here and looks around here. But inside there, uh, this is a cast pulley. So they can have some different features inside there. Um, there's a flattened off space. So the hole inside here actually looks kind of like uh, this. So there's the hole and then built into the hole is a flat spot. So sometimes we'll call that like a D, kind of looks like the letter D. Um, and that guy has a matching feature on the shaft. So that kind of kind of works the same way as a set screw, but it's more, uh, there's no pressure between them. It's just that you slide this on and it indexes it to where it will only fit one way and um, once it's on there that feature matching up with the feature on the shaft should keep things uh, from uh, spinning relative to one another so if the shaft turns the pulley pretty much has to turn um, you don't see that on all types of shafts but this particular one does have that um, so one way you can attach and transmit torque from a shaft to a pulley or a pulley to a shaft. Um, relatively common, you'll see these a lot of different places. Uh, they're um, easy to deal with. You know, you've got a simple to use little screw. This one's actually at an angle. If you can see it in there. Uh, most of the time they come in, you know, normal to the surface here, but this one's actually coming in at an angle. Uh, that's less common. This is a pretty old drill press. I'm not sure exactly how old, but 50, 60 years old, something like that. Um, let me put that in there before we lose it. So we do need to reassemble that at some point. All right, so that's one thing. And so your book has uh, a section that uh, miscellaneous shaft components, and it has uh, a couple of set screw features here, and then it has one table, pretty sure it's just one table, yeah, just one table for the cut points. Uh, obviously, other tables do exist somewhere. Uh, they're just not in our book. Um, so that's how we would work with that. And if you had more than one of these, if you did have a second set screw, then we would just have a second force. Normally, you're going to have the same type. You wouldn't have a, a number 10 here and a number 6 over here. Normally, they're going to be the same set screws just to make sure... Um, that you don't get them mixed up, it's easy, you only have to have one type of part, so um, normally you're gonna have two of the same type of set screws if you have two. Um, and if you had another one, you would just add the second holding torque, or holding, holding force, um, and you would just have two of those times uh, their radius, which should be the same. Um, so we'd end up with uh, 270 inch pounds if we had a second one. All right, so that's, set screws let's look at since we have uh the key which i've lost now i don't know i've got a big mess here we showed it earlier but now i don't know what to do with it but there is this little groove inside here where that little key i guess i set it somewhere and now it's moved I don't know. I'll find it later. Um, there's a matching key that will fit into that uh, slot. And this, I don't know if that's what's actually next in your book. Let's see what's next. Uh, keys and pins. Uh, so they actually go through pins next. We'll look at those last. I don't have an example of a pin uh, handy. Um, but here's some examples of keys. 
looks like they mainly have these tables set up for woodruff keys. So we do need to talk about different types of keys. Um, they have two shown here, but there's several. All right, so a key, in this case, what we're gonna have is, let's, let's draw our hub again, or here's the pulley we're dealing with, and it has some sort of, let's make it a little bigger, hole in it, and then this time I won't exaggerate the uh, distance between the shaft and the hole quite so much. So there's the shaft. And here, <clears throat> what you want to do is you actually, so you create these things and then you go back and you cut out a little slot here and a matching slot over here. Well, the, the slot on the other side may not be exactly matching, um, but it'll be similar. Um, there's some different shapes in there, so we'll talk about that in a minute. And then inside there, you will slide in the little key. And so inside, there's a slot on the hub and a slot in the shaft. You can see the slot in the hub right here. There's this matching uh, slot on the shaft also that I have on the floor over there. Um, and the key will slide in there. So this one, the keys don't do a whole lot necessarily for keeping the shaft from moving because the key's just sitting in here. Um, there is one in your book, the gib head key, see how it's out and tapered in there? It will shove itself in there. Well, you, you shove it in there. Um, and with that taper on there, it will wedge itself in there and it will help also actually axially align the shaft or well, the pulley on the shaft so that you don't have a lot of this kind of motion. A lot of these keys are just rectangles. So they're just a rectangle that um, doesn't do a whole lot for keeping the uh, pulley from moving axially on the shaft. Um, they, their main purpose is to transmit torque between the shaft and the pulley or the pulley and the shaft, whichever way you're going. Um, and they also have the added benefit of if something does happen, then they'll just shear right across this uh, shear plane. Um, and you take the machine apart, you just have to replace that little pretty cheap key versus having to replace the shaft, which is a major undertaking most of the time, or replace the pulley gear, whatever this hub is attached to. Um, okay, so how to deal with these things. Let's look at a side view. That might help a little bit too. So if we have a side view over here, uh, say that something like this. So this will be the shaft. Um, somewhere in here. Now normally how you make this thing, there's two particular ways that this might happen. Um, one is you just come in from the end on a horizontal mill and cut the slot all the way from the end or the end. So that little slot would be just be cut all the way until the end of it. Now, usually at the end they don't have this slot. Normally, this sharp of a corner, normally it does kind of raise up. Because you're normally using some type of uh, cutting wheel that comes in and that's where you lift out. Um, it may not be exactly that shape, but it'll look something like that. Um, that's, that's one way you might make these. Um, and then you would have the hub, this guy. Um, it's going to, you know, again, I'm exaggerating the, the tolerances on these things. This is, I don't know, it's attached to something. We're not too concerned right now with what it's actually attached to. Something like that. And then the other half of it, somewhere over here. OK, 
Okay, and it'll have, again, a matching slot cut into it. Again, also probably the same. Now this one is going into a hole, so it's cut with a different, maybe a shaper or something like that. Uh, you normally can't get an actual uh, wheel inside there to cut that because this is inside this hub. Um, so it's probably cut with a shaper. Um, and so there's your key sitting inside there. And so the idea being that you slide the hub on, you put the key in there, I really wish I could find the key I had, mainly because I need the thing, but I don't know what I did with it. Set it somewhere. Um, so I'll put it down here. Oh, I found the belt. Oh well. Um, so you would slide the hub. Let's turn it this way just so we can see better. Hub on there. Um, and then you would put that key in those two slots. So the easiest thing uh, is just one of these rectangular keys uh, and you go in and basically you calculate it's a shear stress. Tau equals V over A where V is gonna be basically the force on that surface. Um, and A is the area, so the area is how long, uh, let's use this, how long is the key, so I've got it something like that, um, I don't know if that's exactly where the key ends or not, and then how wide is the key, so area would just be length times width, um, so it's a little rectangle uh, that shows up on that surface right there. Um, and then tau, and so normally you're solving for V, right? So you want to know how much force is it able, how much shear force is able to carry between the hub and the shaft. Um, and tau would be something like the uh, shear strength of the material that the key is made from. Um, let's just pick a number since I don't have one right handy. Let's just say that tau max so this is the uh, shear strength of key material. Um, let's just make it equal to 20 KSI. So that's a, that's a good shear strength number for made up material. So if we had that, um, KSI, and we would say that uh, we need some dimensions here. Let's say that the length, we made this key, uh, the one that we had was about a half inch long. And then the width of it, it was really narrow. Uh, let's make it an eighth of an inch. So that's 0.125. <clears throat> and they're gonna be all different shapes inside. Well, they're gonna be relatively rectangular other than a couple of these, the tapered ones and the uh, woodruff that we'll talk about in a second. Um, but they're gonna be dimensions similar to that. They might be longer. Half an inch is kind of short for a key. But so our uh, V, the force that we're gonna be able to carry before the key shears over our length, half an inch, times our width, 0.125 inches. Uh, we can solve for V. Let's see. V is going to equal uh, 20,000 times 0.5 times 0.125. We're giving V is 1,250. All right. 1,250 pounds before we shear that. Now that's not the torque, that's the force that we can put right here before the key shears, assuming that it actually has a 20 KSI shear strength. I don't know, they might be lower, higher, uh, it just depends on the material. Um, and I totally just made that number up without looking up anything. So, um, so we do the same thing again. So we're back over here, there's some radius to our shaft. Let's just keep the same size, so the radius is quarter inch again. 
Uh, and so the torque that we can transmit is equal to V max that we can apply times R. Uh, so our maximum shear force that we can apply, 1250 pound force. Our radius is the quarter inch. And we can multiply those together. 312.5. Getting off the page, aren't I? Inch pounds. So um, we only had 135 inch pounds with our set screw and our made up key here can carry 312 inch pounds but the key doesn't do as much to keep the pulley from translating axially along the shaft um, so the norm normal procedure is that this key um, is associated also with some other thing so you have the key to transmit most of the torque and then you have a set screw to also help transmit torque, but to, to keep the shaft from moving axially. <clears throat> okay. Um, and you can see some problems even on this one. You know, this, actually this may be the shape of this keyway, um, but a lot of times these keyways can get worn a little bit. Um, the keys can back out uh, of the shaft. You know, if this, if this is just slid in, then it can also slide out. Um, there is a way to keep the key from moving back and forth, and that is to use the Woodruff key, which your book, your book has a couple of tables for Woodruff keys because they're a little bit different. So let's draw what a Woodruff key, uh, let's just put him down on the bottom of this so that we don't have to draw a new one. So a Woodruff key would come in here and look something like this. So the key itself would sit in here something like that. So that guy's a Woodruff key. So it does have a couple of different things. Now we'd have to cut this slot over here so that we could actually get the pulley to go on there. But um, this key looks kind of like a half moon. It's not actually a half circle though. So the center of this Woodruff key is somewhere up here actually. Um, so it's the bottom part of uh, a circle, not the whole bottom half though. Uh, so you end up with something that's kind of, there's a sector across here and uh, the part of a circle beneath that is the the Woodruff key. <clears throat> and to make this in the shaft, um, that same little circular cutter that came in here and milled out the groove for the shaft, here you just plunge into it and cut this little half circle-ish shape out of the shaft. Um, so now when I put this key in here, so I put the shaft together, put the um, Woodruff key in, uh, and it's going to sit there and the key can't move now. It can't move left and right. So I, I at least don't have to worry about the key, like this rectangular key sliding out the end. Here the key is captured. Also it does a couple other things. Since it has a deeper purchase in here, um, it's not going to roll. So how a great way to show that is, but uh, with a little rectangular key sitting in here, that, that key can actually roll if... Uh, it and it not shear so it can actually carry some torque um, without failing and still be failed so it, it doesn't actually shear but it can roll in that groove um, Woodruff key can't really roll because it's it's uh, much deeper in the uh, slot there um, what are some other advantages of the Woodruff key let's see I wrote some down and now I'm forgetting Um, well, no, no, those are the main things I'm thinking of anyway. Um, so it doesn't roll and it doesn't move left and right. Um, it doesn't necessarily hold any more, uh, torque 
uh, it can, uh, but that would be based on how long it is. Um, it is a little bit tricky to figure out the shear area here <coughs> in your chart. Here, uh, you have all of this uh, information on uh, key size, WD, height, offset, uh, and key seat depth. So all of these, uh, I don't know that they give you, okay, over here, they give you some of the dimensions. Here's a diagram of a Woodruff key. Um, the D is just the diameter of what this, if you completed the circle, see how they've got the, um, the uh, Woodruff key actually being part of the bottom of a circle, not the whole half of the bottom of the circle. So D given over here in the chart is actually the diameter as if it were a whole circle. Um, w is just the width, so that's how thick is it. Um, and then there's these others, height, offset, key set, depth, and all that. So we probably need to show you what those actually refer to. So um, let's put them over here. Let's draw a bigger Woodruff key. So, let's do something here. All right, so something like this. All right, so This is the key, the actual key. And then there's the circle that it would be cut from, or not cut from, it, or however, you know, if you had a whole circle. Um, so in our chart, so let me get it out here and get everything on the same page without destroying everything. All right. So our key, um, let's just pick one of these here the one inch one, We're, we've drawn it way bigger than one inch, but that's okay. So one inch, that would be the dimension here. So this guy would be one inch across there. Um, what else do they have in here? So I'm looking at the width of one quarter, that's the end of the page. So that shows up in our shear calculation as the um, same thing so we had over there. Um, what else do we have? B, 0.438. All right, so B is not that I know of shown anywhere on your, um, in your book, which one is uh, B? So B is the height. Let me make sure I get this one right, where it actually goes. Mm. All right, so B is gonna be this distance. And for the one inch guy, that's 0.438. So from here to the bottom should be half inch, right? Because it's the radius. Um, oh, I wrote, I just drew it from the wrong one. That's B, whoops. Ignore that part. <laughs> so from the center line of the circle, imaginary circle, to the bottom would be half an inch. B is from the top of the actual uh, Woodruff key. And that's uh, 0.438. If this, this key is the uh, one by one quarter Woodruff. <clears throat> All right, so there's B. Uh, what else do they have in here? They have E is the offset of 1 16th. Um, let's see. I don't know that we really even need that. Hmm. We'll come back to that one. I'm not 
thinking of what that is right now. Um, these, the keys, these two over here are the key seat depth. So for a shaft or for a hub. Um, so obviously this thing has to exist in the shaft some and in the hub some. Uh, and so those dimensions refer to how deep, so depth, how deep is it into the shaft? Uh, so it needs to be 0 0.2768. Uh, these are inches, the inch series chart, so inches uh, into the shaft. So somewhere we've got the shaft. So the shaft would be, I don't know, somewhere over here. I've been using orange for it, so there's the shaft. So into the shaft, it would need to seat. Uh, what did it say? 0.2768. And then it also needs to seat into the hub some. Uh, so the hub, I'm running out of colors. Let's make it red. It's going to seat 0.1622. And so you can start to figure out um, where the actual shear plane is for, you know, where is this going to shear? Uh, and you need to know that so that you can do a similar calculation over here. Um, so all the dimensions for a variety of these Woodruff keys are given in the chart 77, table 77. Um, down here they have the table 7-8 gives you recommended sizes of uh, woodruff keys for different diameter shafts so that you kind of know. Obviously, you do have to uh, control how deep this thing is because you don't want to cut out too much material from your shaft because that would be another problem that you'd have to deal with. Um, so those are keys. The point of them is to transmit torque between the element and the shaft. So the shaft. Um, while you still have to figure out how do you keep the pulley or gear or whatever you may have attached to the shaft for moving axially. A lot of times the keys themselves won't do that so you add a set screw or a snap ring. Maybe you put a, we haven't really talked about snap rings other than we mentioned them creating stress concentrations on the uh, shaft stress example uh, a while back. Um, but you usually need to uh, pair keys with some kind of axial constraint. Maybe you just use a, a step shoulder on the shaft to keep the uh, pulley riding against that shoulder. And then you fix the other end with a set screw to keep it from moving the other way. Or maybe you use um, a snap ring, although set screws are relatively common. All right. I think we have enough time to do... One more thing, and that would be to look at, and I don't have an example of this, but look at pins. So pins are going to work similar to um, a combination. They're kind of a combination of the, the keyway because they, they do uh, have a shear plane that's going to transmit torque. Um, actually, they have two usually. <clears throat> and then also they work to keep the shaft axial, axially aligned, uh, similar to how a set screw would. The difference is, in this case, um, with a pin, so pins are these four, these two are uh, keys, a square key and a round key. Um, so the difference with a pin is that you take, put the uh, pulley or whatever you're dealing with, wherever you want it, and then you drill all the way through the pulley and the shaft, and then you're going to insert that pin through that hole or those four holes. Uh, they do have this one other example over here where it's on the um, uh, a pin on the side that's kind of working like that D shape that we talked about, except it's removable. Um, so I'm more talking about these kinds. So the difference here, this guy is a solid pin, so it's like a dowel. Uh, well, kind of like the pin, you just shove it in there. 
um, and it's going to shear on those surfaces similar to how a um, the key is going to shear except it's going to shear twice once at the top once at the bottom and it's a solid round piece of metal um, this guy over here this is exaggerated uh, normally they don't quite look so tapered but this is the same idea except it's tapered um, so the nice thing about the taper is that uh, it does create a little wedging action and um, if you take this thing apart sometime then you can ream this tapered hole out a little deeper um, so it becomes a little bit wider but you can clean up you can dress the holes again you and use the same style taper and just it'll insert further a little bit here um, you kind of it's hard to redress the holes here you just basically can make everything bigger and put a bigger dowel in um, here you can do that um, all of these can suffer this one is different this one is a roll pin so they're kind of showing this cross hatch thing this is hollow in fact it's usually um, a, made from a flat sheet and curled up you know curled up into a cylinder shape so it's usually a little uh, slit in them so they're kind of spring loaded uh, so when you put them into the hole between of the shaft and the uh, hub um, they kind of hold a little bit of extra tension from falling out so basically um, if these guys are oscillating so going back and forth so the pulley is you know doing something like this um, there is a little bit of a tendency for these particularly the wedge type to work their way out um, the roll pin guards against that a little bit just from being spring loaded sort of um, so these three are the ones I'm talking about uh, these two probably seem pretty straightforward because uh, you just have a shear on a circular area here and a shear on a circular area here the circular area is determined by how big the um, dowel rod is here it's a you know a little bit of a change because it's hollow but it's still circles you can treat it like circles so those are probably pretty straightforward and once you get those areas it works pretty much the same as the uh, set screw did as far as calculating the torque um, except that instead of uh, actual force being you know pressed against it you're gonna have to shear the pin so in that sense it's kind of like the set screw uh, uh, key um, the taper is a little bit different because you do have two different sizes here um, so obviously let's, let's draw a picture so I don't draw my book so let's get our let's make a big one so there's that's gonna be the shaft and then we'll put our tapered and now these things are not nearly as tapered as what I'm gonna draw but I want to exaggerate it so there's our tapered pin and in fact um, this taper is generally one of two ratios it's either 1 to 48 so for every um, I guess 48 feet long it would taper in one inch um, or 1 to 50 so the metric sizes are 1 to 50 the standard US sizes are 1 to 48 um, and so they're not they they basically almost look like a dowel rod you would expect to look um, but I'm exaggerating it so that you can see that there is a different size area here these are normally solid they're not hollow um, and a different size area here uh, that you have to deal with and then once you get those you are left with uh, finding the shear stress on these things so maybe you have a tau max that's available uh, depending on the material uh, I think we used 20 last time KSI uh, and then equals V over A now you might here's where you might uh, start to question like well I've got a tiny area here and a big area here are they going to actually provide the same uh, like would this just shear first before that one um, and so what 
generally happens in things like this, and this goes back to our stress strain plot. So normally your stress strain plot does some, you know, curve like that uh, if you do the engineering stress strain plot. Um, but a lot of times we use a model that looks like this. So it's perfectly elastic, perfectly plastic. Um, and so we don't have this, you know, nonlinear part. And what this model is telling us is that, okay, yes, this part might, uh, one of these sides, the, the less stiff part, uh, well, the, the stiffer part is going to carry more of the load, but, um, the stiffer part is also going to reach this plastic model region earlier uh, because it's carrying more of the load. And so as that uh, uh, larger stiffer part, so up here, um, this stiffer part is carrying a larger portion of the load, it will begin to deform uh, first. And as it begins to deform, that will cause the other one, whatever the other component is, it's not. The, this isn't a model just for tapered pins um, it will cause the other components in the system to start picking up some of the slack basically um, as the stiffest part begins to deform uh, and so it will eventually all equal out and again this is not um, uh, the actual dowel is much less tapered than what I've drawn here um, so I've exaggerated it, it here that might make it look like intuitively that's not going to happen um, but I'm kind of exaggerating things. All right, so assuming that we end up with something like this where um, they more or less both are going to be uh, dealing with 20 KSI, uh, up to 20 KSI of shear stress, then all I need to do is figure out, well, what are these areas? And uh, then I would need some information and usually the information I'm given, I don't think your book has charts for these. Ah, they do. Here we go. Um, they do have dimensions at large end of some standard taper pinch inch series. So I've got a couple of different sizes here, seven different sizes. Um, and I've got uh, some ranges on the maximum minimum size of the large end. And then I've got commercial and precision. So if I won't tighter tolerances or whatever because a lot of times these are used for alignment uh, purposes so if your pin is not quite the diameter you think it is then things may not uh, it may not uh, seat in the hole the way you want it to uh, oh so uh, let's see they give us something like some of these bigger ones have a uh, larger end 0.4933 inches. That would be for the uh, 8. And I got that from table 7.5. So I got it from there. Um, and so what that does is it tells me the size, the diameter of the larger end. Then what I need to do is I need to figure out using, uh, so this is uh, inches. So I would use the 1 to 48. Now your book does actually have a little equation here that uh, basically is how you would go about using the, uh, uh, in fact, I assume, let's see, one divided by 48. Well, it's close, this is approximating, but uh, one, oh, I did for 145th, one divided by 48. There we go. Um, so 0 0.02083, 0 0.0208, uh, this equation, uh, is basically helping you figure out, uh, based on the taper ratio, the 1 to 48, uh, if I start out with a certain diameter here and I go down, you know, this far, L, in this equation, L, uh, so the equation is D equals D minus 0 0.0208 times L. So D is the large diameter, small d would be 
the diameter at the location you're trying to calculate. Uh, and then L is how far down the taper did you go. So this, but this equation with the 0208, that assumes 1 to 48 taper, uh, which assumes US units. Um, I suppose you could create an equation D equals D minus and then 1 divided by 50, O2. And that O2 would assume 1 to 50 taper, which is metric. Your, tr your book doesn't have a chart for metric numbers anyway, but it would just be D is five millimeters or whatever they, I don't know the sizes of all of the possible metric taper pins. Um, and so we could get this diameter D from this equation, uh, 0.4933 minus uh, 0.0208 times, uh, we would just have to figure out how deep did this uh, basically how far did it have to go through the hub you know I drilled a hole through here so how thick is the hub so I don't know three-eighths of an inch so uh, 0.375 and we get that lowercase d diameter 0 0.4855 inches and then to get this one you would go down however far this is. So in our case, we had been saying that this was a half inch, so 0.375 plus 0.5, uh, 0 0.875 inches. And we could get this guy as uh, 0.4933 minus 0 0.0208 times uh, 0.875. So this guy would be 0 0.4751 inches and then I'd have the diameter of this circle and I'd have the diameter of this circle uh, and I could go in and figure out how much uh, shear force each of them should be able to carry uh, and then do the same thing where I have a circle the shaft circle with some amount of force being able to be carried here some amount of force being able to carry here and I uh, add those two torques together, force times the radius of 0.25 inches, add those together. Similar to how I did with the set screws and the uh, keys. Okay, so we don't have time to go into uh, limits and fits and interference fits. So the other thing you can do, so, oh well, let's finish up these guys. So the pins, drilling a hole through the uh, pulley and the shaft and putting a pin down through there, obviously helps with torque, but it also helps with axial alignment. Um, it is possible, I've only done a torque calculation here, it is possible that um, if this was a gear with certain shaped gear teeth that it's pushing uh, axially, so they, they might have to carry a little bit of an axial load too. Um, I've kind of, we're just looking at torque right now, but the, it, there could be an axial force on this pin uh, wanting to shear it as well. That's usually probably gonna be pretty small compared to the torque it's carrying though. Um, uh, and the other thing you can do, so you've got set screws, you've got keyways, you've got pins, you just drill all the way through. Um, the other thing you can do that we mentioned earlier is that you can size this hole smaller than the shaft it's going to go on to so that you have to force them together. And that's called an interference fit. Um, we'll look at those next time. Um, we're out of time for today, so we'll figure out how to uh, either make a separate video or put it in the next lecture. Not really sure, um, but we do need to talk about those because they're a little bit different uh, on how you actually deal with figuring out how much torque can be carried by just things being shoved together uh, and how, how big how, of a difference can you have between the hole here and the hole on this or the shaft's diameter. Um, obviously, if the shaft is too big, then you will crack this hub and you won't be able to, uh, well, you'll just break your parts, so it won't work. All right. Um, if you have questions, let me know. Um, you can email them. You can put them over in the Discord chat or whatever, and uh, we'll go in and try and answer those as best we can. All right.